So I wanted to continue on with uh, section five of the first chapter of Ducell, the transversality of transmodern intercultural dialogue, mutual liberation of universal post-colonial cultures. Okay, that's a mouthful. All right, uh, let's see. Thus we arrived to the most recent stage of development, which as always had been anticipated in earlier intuitions, beginning from the new hypotheses of André Gunn de Franck, his reorient global economy in the Asian age, and the more complex argument put forth by Kenneth Pomerozan uh, in the great divergence, China, Europe, and the making of the modern world economy which again allows us to open up a broader critical problematic, which should take up again the interpretive keys to the problem of culture that we have discovered in the 1960s. We are now able to introduce a new theoretical proposition, which we call the transmodern. Okay, and here's transmodernity in the title of the entire book. So he's, now he's going <clears> to <throat> explicitly develop this concept. Uh, and which constitutes an explicit overcoming of the concept postmodern or postmodernity, since the latter still represents a final moment of modernity. This most recent working hypothesis can be formulated in the following heavy, heavily simplified manner. Modernity, capitalism, colonialism, the first world system, is not contemporary with European uh, hegemony, which functions, uh, which function as the center of the market with respect to the rest of the cultures. The centrality of the world market and modernity are not synchronous phenomena. Modern Europe became the center after it was already modern. Okay, so there's just this, this uh, mismatch between the his actual historical development of Europe and uh, the notion that Europeans tend to have of modernity. Okay. For I. Wallerstein, these phenomena are coextensive. This is why he delays modernity and its centrality in the world market until the Enlightenment and the emergence of liberalism. In my view, the four phenomena phenomena, capitalism, the world system, colonialism, and modernity are contemporary to one another, but they respond to the centrality of the world market. Today then, I should note that until 1789, to give a symbolic date for the end of the 18th century, that's when the French, first Re French Revolution happened, China and the region of Hindustan had a productive e economic weight in the world market producing its most important goods like porcelain, silk, etc. that Europe was not capable of matching. Europe could not sell anything in the market of the Far East and it has only been able to make purchases and it, and it has only been able to make purchases in the Chinese market during the past three centuries thanks to Latin America silver, uh, primarily from Peru and Mexico. Europe began to function as the center of the world market and therefore to extend the world system throughout the world with the advent of the Industrial Revolution. On the cultural plane, this produced the phenomenon of the Enlightenment, the origins of which, uh, in the long run, we should look for according to the hypothesis of Moroccan philosopher Al-Yabir Yabri, who we will discuss later in the Averroist philosophy of the Caliphate of Cordoba. Okay, so I went into, a, a, in my historical survey, I went into a lot of detail concerning Averroes and uh, Cordoba and the rise of, of the Spanish Empire in relationship to the uh, Al-Andalus Caliphate. Uh, uh, precisely for this reason, Dussel is 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 
pointing to that history and and the existence and influence especially of the Islamic Caliphate um, as a key fact in his notion of transmodernity because he's going to say, and he's already said this in the, in the previous chapter, is that modernity begins with 1492. Uh, and, and so the history of the Iberian Peninsula, Al-Andalus, is central to this interpretation. Uh, but many people, um, you know, many philosophers, I think all philosophers kind of know that story, but we, we, we don't pay close enough attention to it. And so uh, we get this, what Dussel sees as a confused notion of modernity. So let, let's see, you know, what he has to say, and if, uh, you know, our historical understanding of of, of this period that he's going to place modernity in, if that makes sense. And uh, I should also say, when he talks about enlightenment, that's the 18th century, that's the 1700s, and the big enlightenment thinker is Kant. So it's with Kant, Immanuel Kant, that the enlightenment comes to full fruition, uh, and, then, and then after Kant, things move into Romanticism. Um, <clears throat> Okay, and, and what he's saying is that even the Enlightenment itself, which is kind of indicative of modernity, has its roots in the philosophy of the Iberian Peninsula, uh, which was, of course, heavily influenced by Arabic philosophy. Excuse me, one minute. Okay. So, where was I? Europe's crucial and enlightened hegemony scarcely lasted two centuries, 1789 to 1989. Only two centuries, too short term to profoundly transform the ethical, mythical nucleus, uh, to use Ricord's expression, of ancient and universal cultures like the Chinese and others of the Far East like the Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, etc. The Hindustanic, the Islamic, the Russian, Byzantine, and even the Bantu or the Latin American, though with a different structural composition. These cultures have been partly colonized, included uh, through negation in the totality as aspect A of diagram one. Okay, so maybe let's, uh, is that below? Diagram one is above. <laughs> Aspect A, bourgeois culture, okay, has integrated. Uh, da, 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 da. And I think what he's really referring to yeah, this, I wasn't quite sure uh, about this when I read this before. Um, where exactly he's saying aspect A falls, because I'm not... Yeah, I'm not sure, but A aspect of this. So where would we place uh, these colonized, uh, you know, incorporated... Uh, cultures uh, you know so I think what he means is this general top area uh, I think there's something like a label missing from this diagram but I believe he's referring to this top portion of the diagram uh, bourgeois culture through enlightened culture multiculturalism and mass alienating uh, culture uh, as I discussed before. Okay. And notice he, he is placing now, uh, he is placing the Enlightenment period, he's talking about like liberal bourgeois culture uh, as enlightened culture, 
Again, he's drawing upon uh, Adorno and Horkheimer here, and he doesn't mention them. Uh, he does later in the book, um, but I think he just assumes that the reader just sort of knows that he's referring to Adorno and Horkheimer. Um, and, and so, uh, but he's talking about enlightened hegemony, which is like liberal bourgeois hegemony in this classical sense of like what Marx and Engels were talking about from 1789, the first French Revolution, to 1989, to the fall of the Berlin Wall and the subsequent collapse of the Soviet Empire. Um, and, and then um, I suppose then he's assuming there's a new era that it begins at the at the at the beginning of the 1990s uh, that we're currently in is maybe the genuine postmodern, but still this is the tail end of the, the modern. Okay. Only two centuries, too short term to profoundly transform the ethical, mythical nucleus, to use Ricoeur's expression of ancient and universal cultures like the Chinese and others of the Far East, like the Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, etc., the Hindustanic, the Islamic, the Russian, Byzantine, and even the Bantu or Latin American, though in a different structural composition. These cultures have been partly colonized, included through negation in the totality as aspect A of diagram one. I think that top portion. But most of the structure of their values has been excluded, scorned, negated, and ignored, rather than annihilated. Okay. Um, scorned, negated, and ignored. Uh, in, the, in this idea of being ignored by the central hegemonic liberal bourgeois culture um, is, is now going to be very important. Uh, rather than being annihilated, it's just ignored. Like you don't have to, you know, you can just pretend like there is no Latin American culture, as he started out discussing at the beginning of this uh, chapter. The economic and political system has been dominated in order to exert colonial power and to accumulate masses, massive riches, but those cultures were deemed to be unworthy, insignificant, unimportant, and useless. The tendency to disparage those cultures, however, has allowed them to survive in silence, in the shadows, simultaneously scorned by their own modernized and westernized elites, the oligarchic elites even scorn and negate and just ignore the, the, the vast populace, the, the people of Latin America and other exterior uh, sort of cultures. Uh, but as the bourgeois liberal elites and the oligarchic uh, uh, bourgeois elites uh, in each of these uh, dominated cultures, as they ignore the vast majority of the population and this people that's rooted in uh, ultimately in indigenous culture, which is a, uh, what does he call it, uh, ethical, mythical nucleus. So this Ricoeur's uh, ethical, myth mythical nucleus, you know, Dussel wants to say that's in the indigenous population. And I think he would, he would also say that it's in, uh, in uh, just the, the, uh, the class of campesinos, uh, you know, the peasants, and even in their religious devotion within Roman Catholicism would still be an ethical, mythical nucleus to draw from. But especially the Amerindian uh, culture is something that he sees as, as being even more substantial than the spirituality of Roman Catholicism in Latin America. Uh, and he goes into that <clears throat> in chapter two to some great extent. Uh, okay, so since the elites, whether in the center, in the hegemonic uh, North American empire of the United States or Europe, uh, or within each country itself, those elites, because they're so Eurocentric in their perspective, they ignore 
Latin American culture and other uh, culture, similar cultures, but that means they don't get annihilated. That means they survive, and they survive in the shadows. And now Dussel is going to see this as a revolutionary force that comes out of culture, uh, not out of some uh, standard militancy or political organization, uh, but he really wants to root it in culture. Uh, so let's see how that all pans out. Uh, that negation, no, that negated exterior, that alterity, that otherness, always extent and latent, indicates the existence of an unsuspected cultural richness, which is slowly revived like the flames of the fire of those fathoms buried under the sea of ashes from hundreds of years of colonialism. That cultural exteriority is not merely a substantive, uncontaminated, and eternal identity. So it's not like there's an existing substance of culture throughout that entire period in this Western modern way of thinking. It has been evolving in the face of modernity itself. What is at stake is identity in the sense of process and growth, but always as exteriority. So again, he wants to say that cultures uh, evolve in their contact and confrontation with one another, and even in exteriority and being ignored, uh, Latin American culture is evolving in response to uh, that Western hegemonic uh, viewpoint. These universal cultures, asymmetrical in terms of their economic, political, scientific, technological, and military conditions, therefore maintain an alterity with respect to European modernity, with which they have coexisted and have learned to respond in their own way to its challenges. They are not dead, but alive, and presently in the midst of the process of rebirth, searching for new paths for future development, and inevitably at times taking the wrong paths. Since they are not modern, these cultures cannot be post-modern either. They are simultaneously pre-modern, that is older than modernity, contemporary to modernity, and soon to transmodernity trans as well. Postmodernism is a final stage in modern European North American culture, the core of modernity. Chinese or Vedic cultures could never be European postmodern, but rather are something very different as a result of their distinct roots. So India and China uh, quickly becoming <clears throat> uh, two of the largest economies in the world uh, and, and, and population bases uh, and, and beginning to dominate culture, world culture more and more, they also have been exterior to the Euro-American um, culture. And, and so they, they have the same, a, a similar experience to Latin America. <clears throat> so this, this analysis is really global. It's not just about Latin America. And that's why I think it's very relevant uh, for this course, because we're, we're not, although we're focusing on Latin America, it's, it's a model which then you can see similarities to in Africa, in India, in China, etc. So um, I think that's, that's very helpful. Um, thus, the strict concept of the transmodern attempts to indicate the radical novelty of the eruption as if from nothing, from the transformative exteriority, exteriority of that which is always distinct, those universal cultures in the process of development which assume the challenges of mod modernity and even European North American postmodernity, but which respond from another place another location. Okay, so he's thinking topographically, and if Euro-North American culture is the center, then other cultures are on the periphery, they're on the outside of, of on the boundary line uh, of this central culture. And so they're coming at things from a different place. And of course that entails a different direction, and it is this kind of out of the box thinking that he's, that he's appealing to, uh, that says that these exterior cultures have something 
uh, profound to contribute to transmodernity as modernity evolves into uh, beyond modernity into what he calls transmodernity. Um, these exterior cultures are going to play a crucial uh, part in that evolution. A future transmodern culture which assumes the positive moments of modernity as evaluate, evaluated through criteria distinct from the perspective of the other ancient cultures will have a rich pluralversity and would be the fruit of an authentic intercultural dialogue. Okay, so here, intercultural dialogue. He wants to uh, try to figure out what, what an authentic intercultural dialogue would mean because he's shown the problems of, of traditional liberal bourgeois multiculturalism. <clears throat> uh, so these, uh, so transmodern culture will have a rich pluralversity uh, and pluralversity, so if there's a universality, that means everybody's in the same box. If there's a plural university, that means there's lots of different boxes and maybe they overlap uh, and of course they come into contact with one another and they can communicate uh, but um, there are distinct perspectives okay um, it'll have a rich pluralversity and would be the fruit of an authentic intercultural dialogue that would need to bear clearly in mind existing asymmetries uh, to be an imperial core or part of the semi-peripheral central chorus uh, like Europe today, and even more so since the 2003 Iraq war, is not the same as to be part of the post-colonial and peripheral world. Okay. Uh, and, and his point here is that the center is shifting more and more to the United States, to North America and its empire, and even Europe now is kind of a satellite of North America and doing the bidding of the United States like Britain in uh, the 2003 Iraqi war. They basically were our, our lapdog uh, in, this, in this conflict. Um, but a post-colonial and peripheral world like that of India in a position of abysmal asymmetry with respect to the metropolitan core of the colonial era does not for this reason cease to be a creative nucleus of ancient cultural renewal which is decisively distinct from, uh, from all of the others with the capacity to propose novel and necessary answers for the anguishing challenges that the planet throws upon us at the beginning of the 21st century. Transmodernity points towards uh, toward all of these aspects that are situated beyond and also prior to the structures valorized by modern European North American culture and which are present in the great non-European universal cultures and have begun to move towards a pluralversal utopia. Okay, so uh, he uses the word utopia here to acknowledge that he is a utopian. <laughs> so the criticisms that Marx and Engels have of utopian socialism do sell uh, to a large extent deliberately adopts a utopian vision. Um, and so all those criticisms of utopianism from Marx and Engels could be used against Dussel. And, and, uh, but, you know, but he's just laying his cards out on the table and, and, and not trying to obfuscate about his utopianism. Okay. And he sees, and he is very optimistic. He sees transmodernity as taking shape already and that it's going to be good uh, because it is informed by these exterior cultures. Uh, an intercultural dialogue must be transversal, that is to say, it needs to set out from a place other than a mere dialogue between the learned experts of the academic or institutionally dominated worlds. It must be a multicultural dialogue that does not presuppose the illusion of a non-existent symmetry. 
between cultures. We will, now, we will now turn to some aspects of this critical intercultural dialogue with respect to transmodernity. Okay, and so diagram two here, uh, a rough sketch of the meaning of cultural transmodernity. Here we see his, his to topography uh, that I was mentioning earlier. So Europe and North America, now North America more central and Europe you know, sort of off to the side, but still within this, this bold circle here. That central core is evolving, uh, just like other, all, all other cultures, and it's moving in a certain direction, uh, but it's, it's evolving in response to these exterior, peripheral uh, cultures, uh, Indian culture, China culture, Islamic culture, you know, these are very big. These, this comprises, uh, you know, the vast majority, these three comprise the vast majority of the population of the planet. Um, and then there's other cultures, okay, similar exterior cultures. Um, and, and then, and, and Africa, of course, would be in there. Uh, but Amera India, uh, and so he wants to he wants to identify Latin America as a Mara Indian, as rooted in this long tradition of indigenous culture, and um, and, uh, and 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 again uh, that that uh, really makes a lot of sense. Uh, and Dussel goes a long way to substantiating the richness of Amera Indian culture and how that could help in the project of transmodernity. Uh, but uh, David Graeber and David, uh, I can't ever remember his name, uh, Cosgrove, or, uh, but I mentioned them before, The Dawn of Everything. There's this new book out called The Dawn of Everything. Um, that book is even better at making Dussel's point about Amerindian uh, culture and its relevance to uh, cultural the kind of cultural transformation that we need. Uh, maybe not as neat and clean as a lot of people would 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 like. They they leave uh, a lot of questions unanswered, but that's because they think that's that's the facts. Uh, so they just lay out the facts and, and they're very good at doing that. And it's an excellent book and fits very nicely with Dussel's project. It's just, it's, uh, it's, it's really a, a really nice compliment to what Dussel's doing. Okay, we will take as the light motive of our exposition a philosophical discussion of Islamic culture. Uh, Muhammad Abd al-Yabri, in his text Critica de Raison Arabe, uh, Critique of the Arab Reason and the Arab Philosophical Legacy, is an excellent example of what we hope to explain. Al-Yabri is a Maghreb philosopher. Remember, the Maghreb is the northern part of Africa near the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, Al Yabri is a Maghreb philosopher, which is to say that he is from a cultural region which was under the influence of the classical thought of the Caliphate of Cordoba, uh, which began a deconstruction of Arab tradition. This culminated in an authentic philosophical enlightenment, a direct antecedent of the Latin Germanic revival of the 13th century Paris and as such represented even a direct antecedent of the 18th century European of La uh, which was, according to the hypothesis of Al-Yabri, Avaroist. Okay, so the way that I presented Arabic philosophy and the history of Spain and Averroes and then how that led into European culture and then uh, the way that I presented um, the history of modern philosophy is, is in line with Dussel's analysis here. I did, you know, retain the notion of modernity as starting with like 
Descartes, but I laid a lot of groundwork so that this this further discussion here will make sense. And and you know he's uh, Dussel is is assuming that everyone is somewhat familiar with this, uh, but he's he's just going to tweak the way that we look at it so that we see uh, uh, his argument regarding modernity. Okay, so I'm going to cut off this video here and then I'll, I'll do these subsections uh, as separate videos.